Hello everyone, welcome back to the card combo show with me, Chocobilly, where we look at the weird and wonderful card combinations in the Final Fantasy TCG, and this week, I am going all the way back to the start in Opus 1, as we have the Final Fantasy X starter deck with the weird kind of additional cards which allows you to customise the deck a little bit, um, and that kind of got me thinking about all these starter decks that include Final Fantasy X from the very beginning uh, when the game was first released back in the West. So uh, yeah, this week I'm focusing on Opus 1, and I'm going to be looking at Laguna, Walker, Gilgamesh, Baralai, and Warrior of Light. Okay, first up we have Laguna, who is a 4 CP 7k uh, with the EX burst. When Laguna enters the field, choose one forward opponent controls. Dull it. If you control card name Squall, freeze this forward also. And if you control card name Squall, Laguna gains plus 2000 power. So he was, this and the Squall of the time were fairly heavily played together, especially because it's an EX burst and a decent one at that. Uh, so the Opus 13 Squall backup is actually a pretty good pairing with this Laguna because Laguna's prerequisites are that it's a card Squall. It doesn't have to be a forward. So just having the Squall and the backup line ready for Laguna to come in, dull and free something, and then Laguna becomes a bog standard 9k as well. That's pretty strong. Um, and also just a nice way to just have that constant effect there with Laguna as well. What's also good is the fact that if you've got Squall in your backup lineup and you hit Laguna as an EX burst, then you also get to Dull and Free something up for that as well. You don't have to rely on a forward just being there. Backups tend to stay there a lot longer and uh, kind of harder for your opponent to get rid of as well. Luge. So let's say you've got Laguna on the field with your Squall backup, and when you play Laguna, you then crack Luge as well. So now Laguna becomes a 11k Brave. Um, so yeah, obviously it doesn't have any attack effects or anything like that from the Opus 13 Laguna, um, but it still makes him quite big and fairly easy to play. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons I quite like this Laguna is the fact that he's got the EXs, so you know, putting three in the deck isn't a bad idea at all. But also, he has that immediate value of coming and dulling and freezing something and then becoming huge at the same time as well. Hope. So, let's say you don't have your school down yet, or maybe you're just not running the backup school, you're going for a forward one. You play Laguna onto the field, you get to dull something out of the way, Hope's on the field, you get to freeze it as well. Renoa. So, I really like this Renoa card, and she was very much the crux of the Final Fantasy VIII decks in Opus 9 and for a little while, but Final Fantasy VIII needs more cards, man, and not just the same name characters. We have enough Renoas, Lagunas, Squalls, Quistuses, Irvines. Well, actually don't have enough, enough Irvines, but uh, still, give us, like, a Martine or Headmaster Sid or, you know, there's just so many other great Final Fantasy VIII characters. Give us more, please. Anyway, sorry. Uh, yeah, so Laguna enters the field, gets does something out of the way, Renault will trigger, and then you can also freeze that forward as well if you wanted. Ovelia. So, um, yeah, just having that threat on the board to have Laguna, if he dies, come back onto the field, freeze something, and again, if you have, also oh, dull something, and if you have the Laguna, squall back up then that also means that he will be freezing something as well so just having that threat there ready to down freeze something so he can block for a 9k if you've got squall come off the field come back freeze something as well it's just really really powerful and last well so uh when a file ice forward you control attacks choose from 40 opponent controls deal at 3000 damage so pretty decent i mean laguna can already become a 9k with squall on the field as well um but even if he doesn't just having laguna attack dealing 3k to something which then means laguna is effectively trading up to a 10 which makes him a lot more powerful uh what's also good about last well is the fact that he is an ice fire and they are the two main elements of the a uh, eight deck um, with the cars like Irvine and Selfie being in fire and pretty much everything else being in ice. So Last Well fits nicely into that style deck. And then Axter, because like I said, Laguna is a nice EX burst. And I think, and actually there's quite a lot of good EX bursts kind of centered around the uh, seven, en oh, sorry, eight engine. Uh, you've got the Searcher Selfie, you have Quistis, uh, there's others that I can't think of right now. But either way, just nice, like, Fire Ice does EX Bursts really, really well. Laguna's a decent one, I think, especially if you have the score backup. And having Axe being able to trigger that whenever you want, not too bad. 
All right, next up we have Barrel Line. So it's a two cost win backup. Dull, put Barrel Line to the break zone, choose up to two forwards, activate them. So quite quite a good ability if you ask me. Normally most of the activated um, or activate a forward backups tend to be paid to water or something like that to activate something. But this is just breaking Barrel Line to activate two, which I think is very, very strong. And I'm surprised I don't see this card get played more, to be honest. Uh, so, Hope. Yep, you activate two forwards. You then get to activate three other characters as well, which could also be your backups. So, activating a total of five things for breaking a backup isn't too bad at all. Rem. Now, this is where th things get fun. So, uh, obviously, at the end of each of your turns, you get to activate Realm. But you can dull Realm to choose one other forward and activate it. So, let's say you use Barrel Eye to choose Rem and another forward. You could then, or that other forward having a dull ability, that means you can effectively get that ability off three times. Actually, four technically. So let's go for Dusk, for example. So you've got Dusk on the field and he is he can dull. During this turn, the cost required to cast your next summon is reduced by one, kind of become zero. Um, it's worth noting that these cost reductions will stack. So you could dull Dusk, then dull Rem to dull Dusk again. You can then use barrel line to reactivate dusk and rem you can then use dusk's ability again then use rem to reactivate dusk and then use dusk a fourth time so you've just reduced the cost of a summon by four uh just by breaking back up and dulling these two which is very strong and rem is kind of like a monster in some weird way because she's just more of a tool rather than an offensive forward but she has really good defensive capabilities anyway um but yeah ultimately you get to reduce the cost of a summon by four which is super strong if you combine that with other um summon reductions with things like Yuna backup or Yuna Lesca forward then you could cast something massive like one cp which is really good Next, we've got Chocobo Knight. <laughs> I mean, it's all in wind, so why not use Barrel Knight or say Chocobo Knight to play a forward or to play a Chocobo onto the field? Use Rem, Chocobo Knight, play another one. Barrel Knight, use Chocobo Knight, play another one. Rem, Chocobo Knight, play another one. Play four Chocobos. I mean, technically, you could play. Well, if we went with Chocobo playing Chocobo, um, I mean, I'm not even going to bother trying to think how many Chocobos you could play, but ultimately, you can play a buttload of Chocobos using Barrel Eye, Rem, and Chocobo Knight. Then you got Mog. Just draw four cards, why not? <laughs> dull Mog, Dull Rem to Dull Mog. Use Barrel Eye, Dull Mog. Dull Rem, Dull Mog. Dull, 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 Dull. <laughs> Donut, this is a bit of a strange one because Donut obviously can choose a monster, Dull or activate it. And actually, Dulling isn't a bad thing now because there's a lot of, especially with Open 15, monsters being played that become forwards and i think we're going to see more of that in the coming sets especially with the recently revealed um dark monster so yeah using donut to be able to dull out of the way it will be just very important i think uh, because the fact that they kind of have this protection that they aren't forwards until your opponent decides to make them um forwards can be very frustrating so being able to use donut to just dull them out of the way before anything can even happen is super useful but yeah ultimately you can combine this with something like flandit which could be a lot of fun uh so flandit you uh dull your opponent or you choose a forward your opponent controls if they don't pay one then it cannot attack or block this turn so <laughs> lots of dulling here uh dull flandit you then dull donut to reactivate flandit dull it again you then dull ram to dull donut to dull flandit and you see where i'm going with this ultimately you can use flandit four times um which you know that's four cp your opponent has to uh pay and each time they have to pay once you use flandit if they can't like stack other things and then do it pay it they have to pay then and there otherwise flandit's defect will resolve and that forward can either no longer attack or block now um so yeah if your opponent's like kind of stripped for cc uh, cc cp um sorry i've been writing too many emails obviously um then you know it's a great way to just be able to push through when they can't block or to stop them from attacking gentiana so let's just dull out all your opponent's forwards and get them to lose all their abilities sounds good to me Aerith. Now there's going to be some sort of wonky play here where you can use Aerith to uh, reactivate three uh, seven characters. I mean, there's already the infinite using uh, Aerith and Zezat to be able to reactivate Aerith and then Dolph Aerith to reactivate three and blah, 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 blah. I've talked about it before. But yeah, ultimately using Barrel Eye to... Uh, or you use Aerith to reactivate three, you use Rem to use Aerith to reactivate three, you use Barrel Eye to use Aerith, and just, yeah, you can reactivate stupid amounts of things. And provided you have enough seven characters, then you can do some stupid things 
at the problem with this is the fact that there aren't really a huge amount of seven characters that have dull abilities or good dull abilities and if they are they tend to be Aerith cards so kind of frustrating but there you go but it means you can at least make way for when there are more seven cards down the line that do have decent dull abilities all right going away from rem now focusing on palum and porum now this will require you to be in three elements but for the four engine i don't think that's too hard to be honest um and ultimately you can just kind of force on one of the other ones anyway uh but yeah ultimately using palum's s to pay s dull dull one active card named porum to only opponent one point of damage so yeah just use barrel eye or sorry use palum and porum deal a point of damage to your opponent use barrel eye to activate them and provide you have another palum s do it again. Do the opponent two points of damage out of nowhere. Not too bad. I also like to use this Porum actually with this Palum as well. Because when it enters the field, you get to activate all the forwards you control, which is actually quite a strong ability. Um, but yeah, maybe you have, I don't know, attacked with Palum or something like that. You know, maybe you managed to actually get a point of damage through with him. And then you play Porum into the field to activate him, then use Barrel Eye to then use the S ability. You know, so there's lots of good ways to be able to combo these two cards together. Lilliset. So obviously Lilliset loves being able to use all the dancers on your field. Backups, forwards, it doesn't matter. As long as it's a drop dancer, it'll work. Um now this is kind of strange because obviously you can dial your backups as well. So using barrel eye in a backup space, which otherwise could be a dancer, um, you know, kind of counterintuitive sometimes but actually there are a lot of good dancer forwards and that there's a dancer that can um, make your opponent's forwards lose their abilities or just using them for the sets effect as well so maybe you went and just keep on dialing forwards just to dial out your opponent's forwards and then use barrel eye to reactivate little set and something else and just keep on dialing more things out of the way um, or maybe it's just a case of you want to deal 8k to all your opponents forwards twice so maybe you don't have enough dancer backup so you just want to use Lilliset another dancer forward and then maybe one dancer backup and then do it again to deal 8k and then another 8k so it's another 16k to your opponent's board Balthier so uh, dull two active job sky pirates and choose one job sky pirate forward until the turn it gains plus 2000 power in haste so let's say you've got I don't know, as you play Balthier onto the field, he then brings, I don't know, Elza onto the field, and you already had Fran and Vaughn. Um, you could use Balthier and Elza to dull to give Vaughn, or actually you could attack with the others first, and then use Bar Barrel Eye to reactivate to then dull to then give either Balthier or Elza haste. Actually, is Elza one that have haste? No, Elza's a draw card one, isn't she? Either way, you see where I'm going with this. Ultimately, Barrel Eye is another trigger of Balthier's effect, which is super useful because it's plus 2,000 power and haste, which is actually a pretty significant uh, power swing and, you know, pretty big push as well with haste. Bismarck, Lord of the Mists. So they have the ability to dull one active wind forward, choose one forward, deal 2,000 damage. So you're effectively turning Barrel Eye into dealing... 4k to uh forward your opponent controls which you know if you dull bismarck and then something else then use barrel eye to do it again that's effectively 8k which is pretty good right gilgamesh it's gilgamesh morphing time uh, it's a 3 cp 7k with gilgamesh morphing time s and two lightning until the end of the turn gilgamesh doubles its power and gains first strike and brave gilgamesh can attack twice this turn you can use this ability only during your turn so he was a big old mainstay back in opus one and i love this card and i still love this card just because of the name of the effect to be honest but also i just love gilgamesh he has a uh, a special place in my heart Right, so Sid Sapphire. So Gilgamesh obviously gains first strike and brave. So once you've you know used the two attacks on Gilgamesh, you can then use Sid Sapphire to take first strike and brave off of him and give it to something else. Iliwa. So being able to just have Iliwa on the field ready, you play Gilgamesh. You can then immediately Iliwa S to give Gilgamesh haste and use his uh, morphing time to then be able to attack twice. What's also great about this is the fact that all your opponent's forwards will lose 2,000 power as well, which means that Gilgamesh's first strike is even more potent. Now, obviously, he doubles his power, so it doesn't really matter, but still hilarious regardless. Ravana, savior of the Nath. 
So just lots of forwards that can attack multiple times, really. So you attack with Ravana, then you attack with Gilgamesh, you use the S ability, you attack with uh, Gilgamesh again. At this point, I'm assuming your opponent probably will have to have blocked, at which point Ravana stands back up, then you attack with that again. Or maybe you are just breaking some of your own backups, also your own forwards, uh, just to stand Ravana back up and just keep on swinging. I love Ravana, and Gilgamesh is a great card as well. So I think these two paired together, along with something like Estinian and, I don't know, Noel, just having all these forwards that can multi-attack, can really apply the pressure to your opponent. Veil Thanos. So, obviously, we've got all these forwards that keep on attacking. Then you want some form of protection. Now, unfortunately, Veil Thanos isn't as good as he used to be because of cards like Leviathan. And, to be honest, just water in general. Uh, having things like Atomos or... Um, uh, or the middle card that everyone plays, uh, Mind Flay, uh, just to be able to steal your Veil Thanos as well. Sad times. But, realistically, he's still a good card, I think, because... Regardless of what happens, he has to be targeted, and even if it is clean field Thanos, it's just another step your opponent has to take to um, get rid of Gilgamesh or all the other forwards that you have multi-attacking. Noctis. So, again, if you've got a few forwards that are multi-attacking, so Gilgamesh and Estinian, let's say, um, you can have those two attack. That will trigger Noctis' ability. Maybe they'll AK something, I don't know. But then you get to attack with them again, which then means you can trigger Noctis again as well. What you could actually do is you could attack with Gilgamesh and Astinian first time, and then choose to not give Noctis haste as the uh, first instance. And then when they attack a second time, party Noctis with those guys, and then you get three of, oh, sorry, two of the effects as well. So yeah, just a nice way to be able to just keep on really hammering your opponent with all these effects and attacks. Realm. So, generally in a Gilgamesh deck, you're going to have a lot of Gilgamesh. Uh, hence the name Gilgamesh deck. Um, and there are a lot of Gilgamesh cards. So, having something like Realm just as an EX burst, or just play onto the field just to go search one of the many Gilgamesh in your uh, deck, makes sense, to be honest. And just having that ready, just to constantly Gilgamesh morphing time, just to keep on going ham every turn, is just a lot of fun. Sildra. Gilgamesh is a Category 5 card, and a lot of the Gilga Gilgamesh cards have different cost. So be able to play Sildra just to get a couple of um, Gilgamesh to your hand. I don't think I've ever said the word Gilgamesh this many times in my life, but here we are. Um, yeah, being able to search two different Gilgamesh cards to your hand and have two S abilities ready to go then and there, not bad. Lava Spider. Now, I know Gilgamesh actually doubles his power when he attacks, but what you can do, and this is silly, uh, you could attack with Gilgamesh, and now you'd actually need to give him Brave beforehand, because otherwise he becomes dull when he attacks, obviously. Um, and then, when he gains the plus 2,000 from Lava Spider, then use Morphing Time, at which point he would double his power, including the Lava Spider buff, which would mean he'd go from being potentially a 14k to actually being a 20k forward. Um, now, Lava Spider would then take off the buff um, so he'd go down in power a little bit once he stops attacking, but still just stupid and funny, and I just wanted to include that. Um, now I think on it, you can actually use Gilgamesh's ability a couple of times, so you could just keep on as many Gilgameshes as you have in hand, just double his power, double his power again, double his power a third time, double his power a fourth time. Um, but yeah, just another way, if you don't have the S ability online, maybe just a nice way to be able to threaten your opponent as well. And again, if you've got lots of forwards that are multi-attacking, having that constant 3k buff on all your forwards when they attack is really good. Ah, uh, yes, Waka. I love this card. One of my favourite cards from Opus 1. I mean, I like a lot of the cards from Opus 1, and maybe it's just my rose-tinted glasses, but I think he's genuinely, or his S ability at least, is a genuinely really good uh, effect. And we're kind of seeing a revision of this with the new Waka card in Opus 16 um, in the starter deck. But still, I really like it. So, uh, when Walker attacks, you choose one forward you control until the end of the turn against plus a thousand power for each forward you control. And then status reels, which is an S and water, choose one forward until the end of the turn. It loses all its abilities and its power becomes 1000. So, pretty strong if you ask me. So, Vayne. You have a constant minus 2k buff on all your opponent, buff, debuff, um, on all your opponent's forwards. Use Walker's S ability, it just pops. Um, it loses abilities, which means if it can't be broken, it doesn't make a difference. Even actually, even if it can't be broken, all it needs is for its power to be made 2k or less, at which point Vayne's minus 2k will take effect and it just pops and goes into the break zone. Um, so yeah, just super strong. Also really good because you've got Walker when he attacks, he's going to be buffing stuff. Vayne already makes stuff big as well. So just really making your forwards huge whilst making your opponent's forwards tiny. <clears throat> Mm. 
Layla. So obviously Vikings just like to flood the field and having Walker with that isn't too bad because Walker buffs a forward for as many forwards you control. So if you've got Layla and three Vikings plus Walker, that is plus five to a forward when Walker attacks, which actually makes the Vikings pretty big as well. Walker obviously can choose himself if he wanted to, but yeah. Ultimately, attacking with Walker plus five to a little 3k Layla means she becomes an 8k, which is a lot more threatening than they were before. Um, so yeah, it just means that you have a bit more clout with your Vikings if you wanted to attack with them. Noctis, yeah, uh, similar sort of thing as before. So maybe for a few Vikings or Walker or something like that, just really capitalizing on when you attack, lots of things happen. So it could be a case of dealing 8k to something whilst also buffing your forwards, or it could be you attack with Walker and something else to give Noctis haste. And then Walker's effect is to make Noctis bigger as well, at which point Noctis can attack on his own. You won't need to party attack because one of Noctis' downfalls is the fact that he is so small. So making Noctis quite a bit bigger and being able to attack with haste, pretty good. Robol Akbel. So there is a Walker backup, and yeah, just having that S potential every turn is pretty strong. Being able to just say each turn that forward is now 1000 power and has lost all its abilities. Just super strong. Now, obviously, Robol Akbel probably won't survive long enough, or Walker probably won't survive long enough um, to be able to have this happen constantly, but I think that's still super strong and a massive threat to your opponent. If you can keep on getting a Walker back to your hand every turn and just keep on swinging status reels at your opponent, it's a lot of fun for you, not much fun for them. Lava Spider, again, capitalizing on attacks. So Walker attacks, he gains plus 3,000 power, but then you also get to buff something else as well. And all those forwards become even bigger when they attack. And you can cap capitalize that on things that, you know, maximize their damage output. So maybe something like Ramza when he attacks. If he's 10k, then you get certain effects as well. Or just, you know, making all your tiny forwards even bigger. Again, Vikings. Chalinka. So when Walker attacks, he gets to buff something. If he attacks twice, he gets to buff something twice. Different forwards, same forward, doesn't really matter. Just getting the same effect twice. Yuna. So Yuna, party attack with Walker, he gets a minus 8k something whilst buffing something by at least two. I mean, it could be one of these two, at which point they become a much more threatening field. But, you know, they're still already 15k as it stands as a party, but it means that if you know your opponent's going to block and kill one of the two forwards, you can at least keep one of them alive. So you could use Walker to keep Yuna alive, at which point your opponent then has to choose Walker to die. Susano, Lord of the Rebel. So this is more just to do with the fact you can, before you play Susano, it's just making sure that something is going to die. So you might, your opponent might have something like Garland from Opus. Is it 15? 14? The one that can't take damage from some of abilities. Um, yeah, using Walker to just remove its abilities and set it to 1000 power as well. Really, really strong. And that's one of the reasons I like Walker so much is it's not just removing abilities. It's removing abilities and setting its power to 1000 is just a massive swing in your favor. And then combining that with Susano to be able to just wipe that forward off the field. It could also be using Walker to just wipe... Um, Ishtola's abilities off of her as well, so that when Susanna enters, she can't cancel it. You know, there's lots of applications for Walker to be really, really useful. What's also good as well is that it could be in your main phase too when you want to play Susanna to so attack with Walker to make Walker maybe a 10k, at which point he won't die to Susanna because they'll do 9k. And finally, we have the little warrior of light who isn't a job warrior of light, he is just a job warrior, which makes sense. And I kind of like that they did that, but then obviously Warrior Lights became a thing as a job, um, and I understand why. Um, but yeah, it'd be nice if this was errated maybe to be a job warrior and Warrior of Light, or if all Warriors of Light were errated to be Warriors and Job Warriors of Light. Obviously they wouldn't do that because there'd be way too much synergy and they'd be way too powerful. Uh, but still, it means that this guy's got a bit of uh, kind of spice to him. Uh, yeah, if Warrior of Light deals damage to a forward of cost four or more, double the damage instead. So Ninja. Ninja allows that Warrior of Light to deal 5k when it attacks. Obviously it deals 5k to a forward of course four or more. That then becomes 10k because Warrior of Light is still the source of the damage. Lava Spider. So <laughs> this card's featuring a lot today, isn't he? Uh, so Warrior of Light becoming an a 8k when it attacks is good because obviously that means anything of uh, less than four probably small enough that it's going to die if it blocks warrior light at 8k but it means that if a forward of four or more blocks 
it's going to be taking 16k in damage, which means it's probably going to die. I mean, if Warrior Light dies, it's a shame, but at least he's definitely killing something. Belias. So, yeah, again, kind of similar sort of thing. Uh, gets blocked by something or blocks something smaller. Just give him first strike. Means he probably won't die. And if he attacks or blocks something bigger, then he'll double the damage and he'll be dealing uh, 12k to something as well with first strike, which is really good. Man has been Warmack. Now, this is interesting because as the owner of Warrior Light, you get to choose how the damage adjustments interact. So technically, if Warrior Light, say, were to deal his damage to a forward, of course, four, um, you could, say, double the damage, then increase it by two. But that would be silly. What you should do is, say, increase the damage by two and then double it. So it would be seven doubled, which is quite funny, to be honest. And again, if you combine this with something like First Strike or the little... Um, card whose name I've forgotten now, Ninja, from the beginning of this second. Um, it could go up from 5 to 7 to maybe pop something that would block Warrior of Light and kill it. You know, it's just a good way to be able to just really increase the damage, but it's also a good showcase on how changing what resolves first when it comes to damage output really makes a difference. Titan, similar sort of thing. You increase Warrior of Light by 2,000 power and then he deals damage to something. If it's cost three or less probably gonna kill it if it's cost four or less definitely gonna kill it four or less i mean four more sorry uh guys so for each war job warrior or card name warrior guy gains plus two thousand power as i mentioned before warrior of light is a warrior so that means he's gonna be buffing guy he's only a little 2k uh, 2k 2 cp but it's a nice way just to be able to give guy that additional buff he obviously probably gonna be running guy along with the other rebels warriors but still just giving that one extra forward a buff is pretty good and finally, Leard. So when Leard attacks, all job warrior forwards you control gain plus 2,000 power until the end of the turn. So Leard would attack, he becomes the AK, but then Warrior of Light becomes an AK as well. And then again, similar to what I said before, Warrior of Light, when he attacks, if he's blocked by something, is probably going to be killing something. Well, the, well, I'm going to say the uh, Final Fantasy X starter deck is on the horizon, but I think by the time this video comes out, it will actually already be released. So it'll be really interesting to see some of the cards. And... There are some really good cards in that starter deck. The Lulu is a fantastic card. Um, I really like Walker, and I think he's in a uh, kind of tribal Final Fantasy X deck pretty good. Braska is a lot of fun well as well. The uh, Grand Summoning ability looks like a lot of fun and really awkward to try and work, but going to do it. Um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to a lot of the cards coming out in this uh, 10 deck, and I love Final Fantasy X as well. as has a uh, very close uh, place in my heart. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for watching, guys. I Let me know what you guys actually know of um, the uh, starter deck because it will be released by the time that I do this video. So yeah, uh, yeah. tell me what sort of uh, cool things you guys have crafted up with the deck as well. Or if you're just playing it as standard, you know, I want to know what you guys think of it. Anyway, thank you so much for watching, guys. Stay safe, be lucky, and I'll see you in the next one.